Uh, welcome everyone to a wonderful edition of the Art Clinic Online. Uh, my name is Jordan Bruns. I'm here with Mariana Kastrinakas, uh, Erwin Timbers, and Michael Janis. And I'm going to introduce Mike, who actually uh, presented oh, a year to day ago. Uh, he was uh, our first class artist to present at the uh, Art Clinic Online. And uh, if you recall, he did uh, some incredible work with uh, kind of these portraitures of, uh, created out of glass that are almost like painted glass in a lot of ways. Uh, he'll be introducing his uh, fellow colleague and uh, uh, co-director of the uh, Washington Glass School. And I, I also want to remind everyone that this uh, program is uh, generously supported by the Maryland State's Art Council and people like you guys who are able to show up here uh, each and, well, not each and every week, but every other week uh, to see uh, who is presenting and learn a little bit more about our community. Uh, so without further ado, here's Michael Janis. Uh, thank you, Jordan, and thank you, Mariana. Uh, I'm going to give an introduction for Erwin Timmers, who just over 20 years ago, together with Tim Tate, who I believe is going to be speaking in a, on the ACO in a couple weeks or four weeks or so, uh, he had co-founded and is the director of the Washington Glass School. And he's one of DC's leading eco artists. Um, I came to the Glass School just under 20 years ago, 20 in August, and that's where I've kind of made my home here. Uh, originally a metal sculptor, Irwin began incorporating glass into his artwork in the early 2000s. And he still uses metal in his work, but he's been a leader in using recycled glass as a uh, sculptural medium. And I want to give a little bit of context to the glass world that he's setting his territory in. The American studio glass movement is fairly recent uh, where artists instead of factories design the artwork. That's only since the early 1960s. And that's the same decade that the environmental movement started uh, rising is becoming a force. And Irwin combines those two worlds, the glass world and recycling world to make a statement using recycled glass as a sculptural medium. I think window glass or what we call float glass is one of the least recycled building materials. And I think that a lot of recycling programs consider it to be the bane of their uh, existence and won't use it. I think less than 3% of discarded float glass is ever used for recycling. So Irwin has to invent, uh, usually through trial and error, to experiment how you can use window glass to make artwork. There's no books about it. And his work in sustainable design with glass has gotten worldwide recognition. I think in the 2013 Venice Biennale, a Danish professor was citing his work in papers about uh, echo themed artwork. And an Australian uh, doctor of philosophy thesis had referenced Erwin Timmer's artwork in their paper about paradox of art and environment. Uh, Montgomery County had recently named him Outstanding Artist. I think that was in 2018. And the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington just recently acquired one of his wall pieces for their permanent collection. Irwin's work is kind of a, aimed at a specific kind of awareness. He has metaphors of transformation and change. And he also likes to focus on this, the craft of design with modern and traditional techniques. I mean, it's all about the aesthetics of sustainability. And with that, I give you our Mr. Green, Erwin Timmers. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Mariana. This, uh, well, that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Mike. That was, uh, that was very nice. I couldn't have said it better myself. Probably never have. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, everything Mike said was true. So um, I um, I wanted to start off um, basically with with this PowerPoint presentation, showing you a little bit of what um, what I've done um, with recycled glass over the past twenty years um, in um, in different ways, both like art that gets sold through galleries, art that we do collaboratively for larger public artworks and also workshops that we teach at the Washington Glass School. So all of those three will sort of figure into um, the whole presentation as we go along. All right, let's see if this works. Here we go. 
there's there's all of us this is actually a number of years ago we were talking about the building being transformed it looks much nicer white now but it is still white so pretty soon we'll have a mural there <laughs> and this is the this is a an uh, older core group of what makes up the studio. Okay, so we've mentioned the three people that are involved, Tim Tate, myself, Michael Janice on the right. We each work in glass. We each work very differently in glass. We each have our own sort of specialties, um, but then we um, collaborate on the school and on public artworks. So this is my early, early, early stuff. So a lot of metal work. I used a lot of recycled metal objects as well in my work, and I always added light to it. Um, and that's why glass was such a um, important medium for me to add. And I'd actually been looking to do glass work ever since I moved to DC and was never able to find anything and then ended up just sort of like starting a program with Tim. Um, Tim knew a little bit more about glass and I figured I could learn as I went along, um, how difficult could it be, right? I mean, you heat something up and you shape it just like metal, but you know, I was proven wrong there a little bit. Yeah, more, you know, and you see in, in all of this early work, when I first started with glass, um, I wanted to bring in windows. I wanted to bring in, melt old windows and I brought them into the studio. I was immediately told, no, you can't do that. And I snuck them in anyways, um, but it's, um, there was no real um, course on how to do this. So I've just sort of like tried making things in the middle. You see like, you know, various bits of broken glass and how they melt together. And I was always experimenting with what looks better. How do I fire the kiln to get different looks? Um, and actually the piece on the right, I think is very similar to, is from the same series as the piece uh, from the Tacoma Art Museum uh, that Michael mentioned that um, has just been acquired there. So as you see, these are all bits of window glass that I shatter and then melt back together. I love these um, old traffic lights. I love the sort of like time frame that I get. Um, we had access to a neon studio at the time, so I was able to bend some neon. Now it's all LEDs these days, but um, um, but the whole idea of a traffic light giving um, the, the fourth dimension of time to your art piece uh, was fascinating to me. So you get this, you know, sequence of events. The Washington Glass School. So. We teach classes as well as make our own work, which I actually really enjoy the classes. I enjoy working with people who are starting out on a new journey in their art career or in their, you know, just after lawyer during the day kind of thing. They want to do something at night to practice their brain in a different, uh, different way. Um, and it's so much fun to see people work with the same medium and the solutions they come up with and the aesthetics they come up with. Um, I, yeah, I really enjoy it. Um, I also teach metal classes and actually the metal classes um, have become one of the most popular staple of the, uh, of the glass school. So they always fill up. I'm always having to do overflow classes, um, but it's, you know, it's fun. It keeps me going. Um, and I, I love that sort of like human interaction that you get. You know, working with your own art can be a little um, solitary at times, but here you just have a big group, we're all working on something. Here we go. Oh, some earlier um, projects using window glass. Um, this one was for the EPA, where we were specifically asked to do something for the courtyard, which was a specially designed courtyard, which was supposed to trap a lot of the overflow rain, which you know, downtown DC doesn't have a lot of places for that water to go. And the IRS was flooded actually a number of years ago because of that phenomenon. And so they were um, experimenting with this new permeable concrete that would let water come down into a cistern below. And the picture on the left bottom that you see is the cap to the cistern that they wanted um, you know, people to be able to look into and be capped with art glass. Um, there's work at the NIH top left, work at uh, the Prince George's uh, Circuit Court uh, top right, that's the family court there, and the um, National Science Center on the right bottom there. 
yeah, those are all fun projects to make. And then, you know, a sort of with the whole advent of LEED certified buildings, um, I've I've worked on a number of them, and it's it's very interesting to see that as a decorative element, um, the recycled glass doesn't really add any lead points or any sort of um, direct benefit to the building owners, but um, it often fits philosophically so well with what they're trying to do with their building that they're you know they're very happy to um, explore using recycled materials in decorative instances. So that was um, a building in Foggy Bottom. Um, and actually it's a little bit of a barcode. And if you were to sort of like squint your eyes, you could see a barcode. And if you were to have a reader, it would say art. So there's art on the wall here. <laughs> and actually, and there was also a fun place on the background, on the right, you see Margaret Boozer's uh, clay work. So she has stone in front of a glass wall. I have glass in front of a stone wall. LEED certified means that it's uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. That's what LEED means. So it's it's all about a rating. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. No. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. And so I've worked a lot for um, private individuals too that want to commission um, a piece of work that was not necessarily just something they could buy in a gallery. Um, this was for an older house in Arlington um, that they had an extension. And so the extension was such that sound traveled through the windows that had been removed and they wanted something that also, um, you know, kept the sound in this one room, but also they wanted something to show their passion for theater. And so my um, task was to use something. Um, I, I, when I go to a theater, I always marvel at that time just before the lights go out and you're looking around you and you see people above you, behind you, in front of you, and everybody's sort of like, you know, excited for the whole play to begin or, and so they, um, and that was my, these swaths of faces that you see, um, was my inspiration for that one. And then, you know, we did get a number of press articles, both in DC and in Baltimore. Um, it was a little bit of a, a novelty at the time. And um, I think um, that has helped get some recognition. Um, and it was nice to be able to uh, further the message through the newspapers as well. Oh, and this is a favorite piece of mine that was, um, it now lives in Florida, St. Petersburg. Um, a little bit of a thematic piece on what future generations of humans would see about us today. What would we leave behind? What are, you know, when, when the flesh is gone, what like things, be it trash, be it valuables are left behind. And so I've taken five decades and brought back items um, that would be then um, cast in recycled glass. And you can like look down like an archeologist would do and look at the various objects that would come from these various decades. Um, as you can see in the, in the highlights, there's the, the Blackberry on the top left and old camera on the bottom left. Um, all these things that are typical for a decade for a specific decade um, would be in that, uh, you know, personal belongings that somebody, if they were just evaporate, would leave behind. So that was the thing, yeah. And it was interesting, I was recently in January, I was back in St. Petersburg at the same place and I saw it was on the wall and um, they um, were getting a lot of attention from people looking at this and trying to figure out what it all was. So the piece lives on and uh, it, was, it was good to see that, yes. Oh yes, so this is for a, a temple in Rockville and they were also big into the whole recycling aspect and they wanted an eternal light, which every temple has an eternal light. Um, and they wanted it made of recycled materials, but I, we had to be very careful not to bring too many broken glass contexts to it from Kristallnacht. 
And so I think I did all right. It's a geometric representation of an internal light, a flame, uh, the red, you know, geometric shapes um, giving the flame. And then the, the sort of like the light comes off of it is represented in the um, amber shards that are behind it. Um, I'm, I hope it is still on because it's supposed to be on 24 seven. So it's, uh, yeah, I've driven by that temple a couple of times. I should just go in and see if it's still on, yeah. Fun project. So I did the Smithsonian Craft Show a number of years ago when their, uh, when their emphasis was on recycled materials used in craft. And uh, they gave me a top spot right in the sun, like at a certain point between 1230 and one, I would be the featured artist with the sun coming through the top skylights, lighting up my booth um, like there was no tomorrow. But Smithsonian Craft Show is a, is a great show to be. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, if there's any craft show that you go see in a year, make it be that one because it's uh, always top notch. So these are some of the items I displayed there. So the, the rubber bands for me is another sort of icon of um, things we use and discard in society on a daily basis without even thinking about it, right? They can be useful items, you know, but, you know, the mailman uses them. Um, but then where do they go? Where do they live on, right? And so I wanted to celebrate that. And I wanted to make all these little shapes um, made out of these um, rubber bands and cast them in glass. And glass, it lasts forever. So it's sort of like turning up, you know, the packaging material and the actual art sort of upside down. And um, they, um, they're very interesting because they're all cast with glass that I got from a, um, it's the, the second Presbyterian church on New York Avenue. And it was a lot, a lot of lighting that they were replacing there. Um, and the, the glass gives a very special refraction of the light that comes through it. Um, everybody that has purchased one of these um, comments on how it lights up, even with like a small ray of light that hits it, um, even though there's no light bulb or anything mounted in them. Ah, and here we go. My pet peeve, water bottles, right? So we use so many plastic water bottles. And why? Right? There's no need. Um, I, I bring my glass water bottle to the studio every day and rinse it out and use it again tomorrow. Um, but it is, um, it's sort of become this symbol of our wasteful society. And, you know, a lot of them are floating around in the ocean right now and being ripped to microplastics. And it's causing a lot more havoc than we're able even to see at this point. Um, I'm still waiting for somebody to take all of these this discarded plastic and um, turn it into useful plastic for new objects. And actually in preparation for my talk on Wednesday, doing some research into that, and it's very difficult. They're having a very difficult time um, being able to use this old plastic and turn it into new plastic. Um, there are a couple of sources, but it's very, very limited. And here we go. This piece was called Potomac Harvest, because this is sort of what it looks like when you <laughs> go digging in the Potomac. And, um, you know, again, water balls, I, they're everywhere. This was a piece about evolution of drinking water, right? Smaller balls. You know, that poster of the evolution of man where like, you know, man slowly starts like walking more upright. Um, and just using bottles in, in many different ways. Now I gotta say, Glass bottles do get recycled a whole lot more than window glass or any kind of other glass. So they're not as much in the forefront of my artwork. Um, I love making these chandeliers. We still have one at the studio, actually, if you come see on Wednesday. Um, but I think in general, the whole plastic crisis is um, far outweighs the glass crisis. Uh oh, I think I need to click twice. Here we go. Okay. And this is a more recent project in Hyattsville where I was asked to create five different sort of lit pillars. And I did this in the theme of the five materials of recycling instead of the traditional five materials of craft. 
And so you got your metal, you got your cardboard, you got your plastics, you got your electronics. Um, and so all of these panels show the top panel, the discarded item, the middle panel more the disassembled or destructed item. And then the bottom panel is more like the item that it will be recycled into. Um, and so I like this whole little storyline. So all of these five um, pillars show that same pattern. And uh, it was um, so much fun to work with uh, the, the, the building owner here because he basically gave me free reign as what to do. Um, and uh, I think it turned out very well. Um, I was a little, his, the building turned out quite busy and I was afraid that my work would sort of like fall, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to see it because of all the, the business of the rest of the lobby. But I think also with the having it backlit um, really brings attention to it. And uh, he was very happy with it. So and the building is called the Artisan. It's uh, on Rhode Island and close to like 38th, 37th Street. And I may have to click again twice here. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Oh, another series. So th this is a series made with objects that um, are usually all packaging from like everyday stuff to some of the squares were focused on packaging for food. Um, the green one was focused on packaging for gadgets. It seems like the smaller the gadgets, the larger the packaging has to be um, just to be able to make it visible in the store. Um, and this was an installation I did in Florida where they commissioned um, two grids of nine on either side of their window. And um, it, it's so much fun also to sort of like track what item, um, this is supposed to go to the corner, is it? Oh, there it goes, okay. Um, if you look at all these squares, it's not immediately evident what you're looking at. And that is sort of like the appeal of this work that you can spend some time trying to figure out what each of these items are. And actually for some of them, people never actually figured it out. Um, even the owners of that piece in Florida, um, they got one totally wrong, <laughs> so there you go. Maybe I'll just leave him in that mystery. Um, but sometimes you don't think about like, you know, the shape of things that you just use on a daily basis just because it's so unimportant and you just toss it away. It's just something to hold your food um, and then it gets tossed. So this is my attempt to bring a little bit more focus and attention to all of these objects. From styrofoam to plastic to cardboard, it's all in there. Favorite, my, one of my favorite ones is, it's actually pretty much dead center right now. It looks like two red spines. Um, I don't know if anybody could guess what it was from. Um, speak up now if you can figure it out. It's, um, it's wine bottle packaging. So, you know, wine gets shipped all over the country now and they need packaging to keep those bottles from breaking. And so that's what that came from. And it has a very beautiful like spine like shape. So well, I'm gonna have to click again twice. Here we go. So this is part of the process. I want to show you guys what I go through to get this glass, right? So it starts with chunks. Now this was chunks either from um, bottles or vases that we get. Um, and then I melt it into a sheet because this sheet I can lay over a flat mold <gasps> and guess what you get here. <laughs> so um, I create a flat plaster mold. Uh, this is with an actual hand and um, that way I can recycle um, often window glass because it's flat sheets already. It comes as a flat sheet and uh, create my pieces that way. It's a technique that um, we've sort of developed. I, I tried it out as just a suggestion from a fellow artist years and years and years ago. And um, it turned out to work so well from the beginning and we've developed it further and further that now a lot of the work that we do is all made through that same technique using this plaster bed. Um, and then whether you start with chunks of glass or a sheet of glass, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, another white screen. Here we go. I got to click again. Here we go. Okay, so now some of the more public projects. So this is a 
uh, Safeway in Bethesda on Arlington and Bradley. Um, Jordan says he drives by it every day. So we have, we use our re recycled glass on the section um, that divides the parking garage from the outdoor sidewalk. And the idea originally had been, since Safeway has such an enormous glass storefront, to use all of that glass. But when I arrived at the destruction site, I'll call it, they said there's just absolutely no way that they could separate that glass out from the rest of the rubble. And so I had to settle for glass that was inside uh, partitions. We had freezer doors. We had, you know, all sorts of glass that came from the inside instead of, you know, the large storefront on the outside, just because, you know, the, the methods for um, deconstruction did not allow for separating that glass out. It's all just in a landfill somewhere. Um, but so what we did um, was we used patterns from the, the various produce and herbs that would be sold through Safeway. We didn't want to make it too much of a direct marketing advertisement kind of thing, um, but also didn't want to stray away from the whole idea of the Safeway either. And so we, um, we had four different leaf patterns or maybe three different leaf patterns uh, that are spread out throughout all these panels. And then there were um, the amber color that you see in the background is a color, if you know anything about glass chemistry, it's very difficult to mix colors and um, clear glass. And so this color had to come specifically from Germany because there's no company in this country that makes color that will go with recycled window glass. And we actually bought out the entire country's supplies worth of amber coloring at that point to make this Safeway. Um, yeah, currently I still have to go to Germany to get this color because there, there's no American glass company that will make color that fits with window glass that we've had success with. There was one company that tried for a little bit. Um, we did not have success with it and they don't do it anymore either. So I guess others were not having success with it either. So. So this is us cleaning out those freezer doors, getting the broccoli off. <laughs> Here you see the process of the flat open molds where we're putting the, um, the leaf patterns in. And, and these are the individual pieces of glass that then have to be trimmed and mounted into their frames. This happened right during the earthquake that hit DC. And um, there was, the panels were not quite tightened down. And so we were afraid that um, there was going to be, uh, you know, big damage when we came to the job site the next day. But luckily, there was one panel that did get some breakage, uh, but the rest was all survived. So um, I think that bodes well for the rest of the, uh, the Safeway. And it's still there today. And this is from at least 10, 12 years ago. So yeah. We actually had um, art groups come and visit the Safeway to see the, the, the partitions and the doors um, because it was such an unusual thing. It was also for Safeway, their first um, lead certified for retail building. And so again, since this was not a structural part of the building, they don't get lead points for it. They don't get any additional sort of like lead worth, but they, um, they do get to do education and tours and show other people um, how they have constructed their building, what they've done. And this is sort of like part of the whole um, uh, building entourage. There we go. And this was opening night. They did it up, boy, with like colored LEDs everywhere. It was something. It was something. We had some... Um, news anchors doing presentations and uh yeah it was something they were very happy and it's neat that at night you see the lights from the interior shine out to the exterior and during the day it's the exact opposite that the sun from outside brings light to the inside of the parking garage as soon as you drive into that parking garage you see all these wonderful colors Prince George's County Courthouse. This one burnt down. This was a wing of the courthouse. It was actually already sort of like decommissioned, um, but the 
cupola is pretty much the only thing that survived. Like you see it on the right. The, you see on the right now the very new cupola that is on the reconstructed building um, on the right top. Um, but the old cupola that burnt down and fell to the ground um, was restored, and they asked us to line the um, so like the exterior of it with castings of, with glass so you could see inside and also that gave them a chance to um, get dedications and names um, inserted on the outside. We used all sorts of legal um, symbols and representations as you can see on the left. Again, this was our last hurrah for the neon. I think this is maybe the last neon project that we did at the studio. Library of Congress. Ah, oh, this is all. This is very. Um, this is our, the with the feather in our cap. Michael completely redid the design for the doors um, on the Adams Building because um, they wanted glass representations of the original bronze doors. The original bronze doors had gotten too heavy for their hinges and could not be opened and closed anymore, which was a, a safety concern. And so the at that point, second in charge of the architect of the Capitol had done a class with us a long time ago and thought that a cast glass insert into these doors would be a fabulous way to go. Uh, and it was, of course. Yes, he was right. But the, um, it, it took a while. I think this project was about 12 years in the making from initial sort of you know instigation to, all right, let's go ahead and like, can we have it tomorrow kind of thing. Um, and we actually teamed up with a, a studio in uh, Portland, Oregon, because it was such a, a um, it was so much work in such a short period of time that we, we couldn't quite do it all ourselves. Um, but this was all drawings to figure out how we could make these um, glass castings fit in the doors and then work with you know the size of the doors and all that uh, and it's a, it was an interesting project oh here this is the this is the Oregon studio you can see the castings there in their flatbeds um, all these figures were figures of cultures throughout the world and in history that have brought um, reading and writing to their culture so from China to the US to Middle East, they were all represented in, in early culture. Um, was it Sequoia was the representative for the um, Americas as um, he had bought, brought a writing to um, the people at that time. And here's the installation. There were professional door installers and they were so psyched doing this that they all had like their selfie taken <laughs> after they installed it because they were very nice yeah what they also didn't what we also didn't realize is that the light would penetrate through the doors as it hadn't before right so now behind there there's sunlight coming through versus before you see the doors are now the old doors are in the hold open position in a niche behind and so they were solid so there was no light coming through before now, if you stand behind there, that whole hallway is lit up by sunlight coming through. But you see, um, yeah, you see all these, um, who is it, Odin, yeah, for the Scandinavian countries, Quetzalcoatl for Mexico. So all these cultures from throughout the world um, were celebrated. Um, very, very fun project. Oh, and I forgot to add, so we had to replicate the original castings. You see them on the left. And uh, that was quite a feat because it had to be done quickly. And at that point in time, it was summer. It was about 100 degrees outside. And then in those little niches, it was more like 120. And um, the silicone that we sprayed on there to replicate the mold, or to replicate the shape, set up so quickly that we, yeah, we almost um, couldn't do it. But um, Sean Hennessy helped us out at the time, and uh, he got it done. Oh, this is this was also a fun project. So in uh, Shady Grove, the cancer center there, um, they had a chapel for people, you know, family members to come visit and um, you know have some peace and quiet time. Often the cancer center is not a place where um, you want to hang out too much. And um, so we had these sort of more peaceful um, 
with leaves and bamboo glass castings to give a little bit more privacy to the people in the chapel from the hallway that is sort of like right behind there. Um, and actually in my last Zoom presentation, somebody mentioned that they had seen that work and were so impressed by it and uh, were very touched by it. This is one of our latest ones. And actually I gotta admit, we did not use recycled glass in this, but I've used, I've recycled um, a lot of um, test pieces into my new work. Um, but it is a piece for at Rockfield Town Center where this building, the Ansel, um, inspired us to do two pieces based on um, sort of bringing Ansel Adams, connecting him to today. Um, Ansel Adams' heyday was about 100 years ago. And in the meantime, we've had lots of um, progress in photography, but today there's this whole Instagram culture that has blown up photography. So it seemed like a very appropriate way to sort of like celebrate his life by bringing it into, into ours. Um, and you see that um, the, the shapes are vaguely reminiscent of tripod with at the bottom of film reel. Um, at the top, you don't see it in these pictures so well, but there's a house on one and on the other one is a car, um, I, items that feature frequently in Ansel's photos. And then we did all of the cast glass panels have something to do with Ansel's life or his work. Um, and the center panels are all <clears throat> hands of people holding a camera, looking out at you. So basically taking a picture of you as you walk around this, um, right at eye height, you see that somebody's taking a picture of you. Originally, I'd wanted to mount a flash in there that when somebody would approach, it would take a flash photo of them. But I was advised against it that it would be maybe too distressing for some people. So um, we left that part out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 gorgeous. And it's right by, you know, I forget the name of the Regal 13 there. Yeah. So if, as soon as you exit that cinema, that's this is the first thing you see. Um, and um, it was a very fun project. I like projects where you delve into uh, a certain topic that you maybe didn't know as much about before and then really get involved in. And uh, yeah, so Ansel Adams was uh, the chairman or the, the president of the Sierra Foundation. He was very much into conservancy. And, um, you know, I totally relate to that, so. And here we go. I've come to the end of my little presentation here. How am I doing on time-wise? All right. So yeah. So come come visit. Actually, if anybody is around on Wednesday, um, I don't know if we if there is a way to get that QR code onto the screen, but we do also have open studios for our artwork. Um, in May and December, we have open studios, and um, people you know will announce the dates, but. It's a great time to come see what we've been up to. We clean up, we make it look presentable. We have our artwork up. And um, also all the other artists in the complex will, or pretty much I would say 95% of them will have their studios open. Great time to come visit and great time to see what everybody's up to. So I welcome you to come see us. And um, that was it for my presentation for now. If there's any questions, I would love to hear them and uh, talk about it. This is amazing and fantastic. Thank you so much, Erwin and Michael. I I want I have so many questions. Don't know where to begin, but I <laughs> I open it up to all. But I wanted to, um, to ask you. Uh, I wanted to tell everybody that I've posted the uh, open not open house the designers. Uh, presentation for Wednesday in the chat. And I will send it out around also after. Oh, great. But so yeah. people know, it, so people have the details and the QR code It's in the chat. Yeah. Thank you everybody for joining us. This is fabulous. I, I don't, congratulations to, to both of you and your team. It's unbelievable what you are able to do. Thank you. Well, it's, it's fun, you know, and it's, it's, actually an interesting concept to have an artist team work on art together, right? In the beginning, especially now it's a little bit more accepted, I think, but in the beginning, we were always faced with like, well, who is the front person? Whose name is going to go on it? Because a team was not really accepted in any kind of application or they wanted a name. Um, and yeah, yeah, no. And so 
it's um, you know something we've worked on, and you know sometimes they still ask for just one name, and then we'll give them one name, right? So, but um, working as a team for me has been um, sort of eye opening. I think as the three of us, we have our talents in very different directions. Um, yeah, Michael is expert designer, drawer, you know, ex architect. Um, he speaks the architect lingo. Right. I'm I'm much of a material guy. I know how to construct things. I know what works and what doesn't work. Tim is an excellent marketer. He's got excellent contacts. And so between the three of us, we we've done a um, we've actually had a very fortunate um, coming together of those talents. Yeah. It is one of those things where it does take a village sometimes to do these larger scale projects. And and it is a thing where we will exchange ideas and sometimes they are in a confrontational thing internally, but then we resolve it by saying, this is the strongest image and that's the one we want to go with. And then we just make it so. So it is a thing where if you are working in public art as another artist, to have a team where you feel able to passionately describe what you think is going to be there, but then able to pull back on your feelings that if that's not the strongest one, you're gonna to have to make the one that is voted strongest succeed. And that means you pull yourself and say, that's the one we're going for. So it is a challenge sometimes. Oh yeah, well, you know, there's three personalities that work there, so. <laughs> and every uh, recycling project or every renewal project takes a team. I don't, uh, how could we expect one person to be able to do everything? And and that's something, a quandary in art in general, I think, because people are encouraged to promote themselves as that's opposed true. to. Yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the hero artist. And that is what they were looking for in the early days was they want to know, especially an agency that was hiring someone, they're saying, I want a Nerman Timmers piece. And so to hear that it's not all Irwin, is something that they weren't expecting. But like, if you say I'm hiring Frank Lloyd Wright, it's not just Frank doing it, it's a whole team. Right, exactly. Yeah, and many Rubens paintings were not painted by Rubens, right? It's, <laughs> but, and, and also we've actually taken this further in a number of projects where we involve either the community that surrounds um, the place, like a Laurel Library is, a, is one that comes to mind where the Laurel Library has a support group called Friends of the Laurel Library. And for the piece that we did for Laurel Library, we invited them all to come over to our studio and make glass pieces that would then be incorporated into the final uh, piece. And so it's not just us three, it's like the entire community there that was part of making it. And uh, that has really struck a chord, I think, with a lot of art committees and, um, we see that more and more that they like some sort of component where the community is involved in making this public art piece. I am gonna point out that Irwin's impact on everyone in the studio is a, is a lot because he will be saying if we have glass that either Tim or one of the other artists is using that there's cutoffs, we cannot throw it out. We have to salvage everything to be recycled potential. And that if we are doing a public art project and that some of the pieces aren't used, he will find ways to melt down and use either for his own work or for future work. So it is a thing that he makes us mindful within the studio. And, and soon we are supposed to be getting solar panels on the roof of our buildings so that electricity that runs our kilns is at least benefiting from the solar power rather than just from uh, the straight electrical feed from DC. Yeah, I wonder when that's gonna happen. <laughs> uh, that's the landlord thing. True, yeah. Can I ask if you, when the December open house, you said you have open houses in May and December. Do, right. you, can, do you know already the date in December or not really? It's usually two weeks before Christmas, I think, right? Because we often in early December have the Miami art shows that we go to. So it's not the first week of December, second or third week of December. Yeah. yeah and the May is right before Mother's Day. So if you if we use the barcode to sign up 
for this one, even if we can't come, will will we be on the news uh, on the news feed? Um, this barcode, I think, is specific for the um, designer day registration. Um, our website has a slot to put your email on, so that you get um, our future emailings and notifications, class schedules, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, the one that's on Wednesday, it's called Designer Day. Designer Day 23, as Irwin likes to call it. And it, it's about showing casing to the uh, collectors, the galleries, the uh, museum uh, curators, the uh, public art commissions, what artists we have in our immediate surroundings here at the Gateway uh, Arts District, which is right over the edge of DC in the Maryland side. And so we've put it together where we have uh, sympo one day symposium where we have talks by different people. Irwin is going to talk about environmental or sustainable design uh, as one of his talks. I think another 11 a.m. 11 a.m. to 4, 4 p.m. on the, I think it's the 28th, and it's centered on the Washington Glasgow, but the other studios also are having talks. And I think that uh, Artist Circle Fine Art uh, is going to give a talk about how they choose people for public art projects. So I think that's one of the talks. I think that Jamie Ann uh, from the James Runwick Alliance is giving a talk in our studio. I think that was not on our calendar yet, but it's a number of different events are happening on. It's a long day, but you're able to kind of walk around at your own pace. There'll be nibblies, but bring lunch if you want to have something to eat during that time, and it should be a good time. Yeah, I think there's also demos. I think Joe Hicks is doing a demo, and Valerie, I think, also doing a demo. So there'll be lots to see and do and hear. Do you think there would be anyone who could Zoom some of the, at least the talks, just because I'm I'm not going to be there, but... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> say the short answer is no. <laughs> oh. Okay. I volunteered no, to come in. To... We're not set up for that. This is our first one, maybe afterwards, and we figure out what works and doesn't work. Then we probably can do it. And I'll volunteer to come and Zoom <laughs> next time. Well, you've got the expertise. <laughs> I don't particularly have it, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> Who does? Who hey, does? Right. We're all learning together. Another group project. Um, I have basic questions about how, how, of course, you melt the glass when you're recycling, but how does it, it needs to be broken down, right? You were saying those refrigerator doors, for example, in safety, you need to break them and then make them melt. Well, sometimes I can use the sheet, the sheet itself of glass. If, you know, I cut it down to a particular size that fits on the mold. And then I have an open faced plaster mold um, that I can melt the sheets onto and it sort of melts down into the voids, into the shapes that I've created in that mold. Uh, that is, that's the easiest way. Um, now, if I'm dealing with like, you know, pots or vases or like, you know, three dimensional objects to start with, then yes, I first have to break it into chunks. And then with that flower pot technique, I can melt it down into a sheet. And then that sheet can be used in the open face mold. Um, I've also done sort of like when you saw the water balls, those are a 3D shape, right? So that is a refractory mold. Um, and then I can just use the chunks and they will flow down into the refractory mold. How do you know in advance which glass can or cannot be recycled? Is this a, a trial and error? It is, yes. I've been offered some gloss that I was very eager to use and it turned out to be unusable. Um, one of my favorite ones was from the Corcoran. So the Corcoran was redoing some of its hundred year old skylights and they asked me if I wanted them. I said, well, you know, I, I would love to, but is there a way to get a test sample first so I can try it out before I get, you know, a whole busload uh, delivered, right? And um, they said, sure, and they had some, and I tried remelting it. And the, the chemistry of that 100-year-old glass was so different from the way that glass is now that it, it didn't work at all in a remelt. It sort of pulverized. It, it looked yellow. It was no longer see-through, and um, it, it wasn't stable. And so I couldn't use it for anything, unfortunately. 
Um, but yeah, sometimes you get those, you know, things that you cannot use. Every, you, every you class have hand. some class that you love, the spandrel glass from that office building. Uh, it, the spandrel glass is the glass that they use to make an all glass building to cover the structure. So you can't see through that window and it's been coated in special ways. And you salvaged all of that glass from an office building that was undergoing a re redecoration. And that was your best glass ever. Cause it that was, was, that was very nice glass. Yeah. Yeah. This was from a building near Dulles airport. It was one of those sort of like dark cubic buildings, uh, all made of glass and they wanted to modernize it. And they were taking out glass rows and replacing it with brickwork and, um, they didn't know what to do with the glass. And so it was actually, they called me up and turned out to be more advantageous to them to deliver the guy, the glass on a truck with two guys than to pay the dumping fees. And I've been using that glass ever since. It's a beautiful dark green and it has this um, sort of E coating to it that is sort of like a goldish shimmery coating that is just lovely. Um, and it stays on there during the firing. It doesn't burn off some of these coatings, some of the paints, all that sort of stuff. Sometimes it turns out to be gone by the time you open the kiln. Uh, but in this case, it all stayed. And uh, I think I have one panel left. <laughs> so I'm saving that for a good piece. Yes. So the color retained was retained. In yes, the, the color was retained. I actually asked our distributor, so what would a panel like this cost, right? What, what did they pay? What? And it was extraordinary amounts of money that that special glass cost. And, you know, it was, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't, uh, but it, it was a, a pleasure to work with this glass. It was so beautiful. It melted so fluidly. Um, yeah. But for a lot of glass, when I recycle window glass, I don't really know where it comes from. Um, and even glass from one building is not necessarily all from the same plant manufacturer. And so I can be, when I recycle glass, I try to make it as pure as possible. So I try to use only glass from that one pane. Because if I mix in glass from another pane, sometimes things go wrong. The glass doesn't like each other. The chunks start to fight each other in the, the heating and cooling process. And then you end up with, you know, not a successful piece. Um, and so, yeah, it becomes difficult to keep all this glass separated and also difficult to predict how each sheet of glass is going to react because they're all different. Are there questions? I don't want to monopolize, although I have more <laughs> questions, but uh, our audience, um, any questions we will entertain, like, let us know. Um, by the way, in the meantime, bottled glass, do you ever use it? And Very little. You saw a couple of examples, a um, couple of reasons, mostly because I think a lot of it does already get recycled. So I don't feel that is as strong of a cause for me. Um, but also the colors are often dark, right? They're often colored dark to keep whatever's in there from getting too much sunlight. Now, if you cast that, it becomes very, very dark, right? Because now the um, the colors are such that if you layer like a layer of one color on top of the next color, it just gets so dark, it's almost black. And that's also not, um, yeah, I don't know. I've done some, it doesn't appeal to me as much as an artist, no. Right, it doesn't. Hey, Lisa, you have a question? Yes. Yes, just a quick question. Can you recycle crash glass? What, how do you mean crash glass? Like from windshields, from auto accidents where it stays together in that kind of crystalline pattern. Oh, okay. So that is more difficult. Um, the windshields, so on a, on a car, um, you have different types of glass, right? So the glass of the windshield is different from any of the other glass in the car. The windshield is actually two layers of glass that have been glued together by a laminate. And now that laminate is impossible to mechanically separate from those two layers of glass. And if you try to melt that all, it becomes a very stinky mess. Um, the glass from the side windows, however, yes. And we've done that. Because um, that, you know, when somebody breaks that window, it shatters into a million pieces. 
That's called tempered glass. So it's a basically standard glass that's had this heat treatment that when it does break, it just shatters completely versus leaving sharp shards because you don't want your head to accidentally, you know, go through, you know, the window and then be decapitated because there's a sharp shard there. So it's meant to do that. Also, the glass on the on the back, the rear view is also tempered glass. Um, and those can all be remelted. Yeah. But the, the windshield, uh, I wouldn't touch. No. I know those are used. Uh, the crash glass is used in mosaic art. Oh, is it? Yeah, no, it's it, it's um, the way that it breaks into those million little pieces. It is um, very appealing. I've made a lot of art where I've, I've tried to keep that pattern um, alive, the pattern that was caused by the original breakage. Um, um, it works very well. Sometimes I even emphasize it by getting color in between all the little crack lines and stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you get color into window glass? I mean, where do you get color from? Well, that Michael knows the difficult questions to ask. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned it a little bit when we talked about the Safeway project, um, how we had that amber colored glass. Um, that color is difficult to come by. Um, there's one company, as far as I know, in the world right now that makes colored glass that will chemically fit with window glass. That will not cause it to break, that will not cause it to, you know, have any weird effects when you cast it. Um, there was a company in Pennsylvania that also tried something similar, but we never had good luck with them. And now they've stopped making any of that, what they call float compatible color. Um, so yeah, this color comes from Germany um, and um, that's where I get it from. It's uh, ordering from Germany is quite a bit of a process. Um, it's not as slick as Amazon. So um, it takes a while also for it to get here. Um, but it's, as far as I know, the only way to get that sort of color into um, window glass. Um, oh, did anybody see the um, Bethesda Urban Partnership Painting Awards? That we, we recently made them. Um, and for that, I also used those same colors, uh, making sure I had the right amounts from Germany to create the colors in the window glass that was used for that award. So. Um, yeah, that's, you can also paint on it. There are some enamels, you know, um, but to get it actually to infuse into the glass, um, it has to be a compatible glass. And then I, I only know the ones from Germany. Do you guys show or have a class for drawing for, for patterns for, or is it something that Michael just does from his architectural? background. They're gorgeous. Um, all I, all yeah, the drawings that you showed us, see it, no matter who made them, they're gorgeous. But I know Michael did a lot of them. Are you talking about the, the, the Library of Congress, for example? Right. You showed us the the, the drawings for planning. Oh, yeah. I see. Yes. Well, that's Michael's specialty. He went to architectural school for how many years, Michael? Uh, yeah, architecture school is is uh, a, a, a five year program, and then also as an architect, you have to do presentation drawings and renderings. So I know how to draw quickly and effectively to just say I'm translating an idea. You can measure a hard line drawing later, but I'm just trying to get the mood and and sell a story. So, well, for I think for us that has worked really well because. None of us know anything about CAD or any kind of other sort of like presentation software like that because we have Michael. Michael draws these things up by hand and it looks way cooler than any CAD program can do. So um, yeah, actually for our latest uh, proposal, we had to go find somebody to do sort of like a 3D rendering because none of us knew how to do this. And, um, you know, besides Michael's drawing, that was the only other sort of like, you know, electronic version of the design that we were able to um, deliver. Yeah, I, I am old, so you go old school, and that's the way I go. <laughs> and so is the lettering also yours, or it does CAD contribute some lettering? I love the um, how readable 
you know, the, the lettering is like when you say, you know, part of the head or the frieze or the whatever, uh, that is just fascinating to me, the calligraphy. Well, uh, a lot of times it'll be whatever it takes to sell that thing. And if it means <laughs> to uh, a computer thing and blur it out to make it look uh, like it's part of the piece, then I will do that. But that, that is a thing where I'm just again saying, I'm trying to sell a concept to someone who's gonna say yes or no for a project. And that, that's gonna be whatever it takes. Well, this, this is absolutely amazing. You, I think you're gonna have a ready audience, certainly from us to, to come to your open houses and to uh -huh. admire your work. And I'm going to Safeway as soon as I can. <laughs> Yes, yes. Take a look. Take a look. I will. Yeah. I have gone there, but not knowing that it was, you know, you, you guys doing. Well, so that, that is, yeah, that is often a little bit of an issue that, you know, a lot of public art is not as clearly designated and it's not always easy to find who made it. There are some apps now that are coming out and some registries that are getting better at that. Um, Arlington recently put out an app in which you can see every Arlington public art piece and you can actually like follow it on, on a guided tour. Um, but yeah, no, that is something. We do actually have a little identification plaque, I think at the Safeway. Um, but yeah, if you get up close, will you be able to see that? So yeah. Right. The accolades are coming in through the chat. And thank uh, you, and how marvelous it was. On the Safeway, did you have, you said you had, do you sign your glass ever or have a little designation for your studio, for example? We do, we do, yes. There's usually a tile that, you know, sort of says who we are and when we made it, and yeah. So, um, yeah, not always, sometimes we forget. Let me check the chat here. All right. Uh, Irwin's signature on his work is usually like a little symbol, like a recycling symbol that has the year in it. So you know that that was an Irwin Timmers. Uh -huh. Yes, true, true. And otherwise, yeah. sorry, go ahead. It, and is it for the studio otherwise or some? Oh, no, that's that's the Irwin Timmers signature for you know, personal artwork. For the, for the Safeway, I think we just made one of the tiles actually says it was by the Washington Glass School. Otherwise, a lot of times that's not part of it and that some of the pieces like the piece we did for the West uh, Palm Beach International Airport, they actually asked us to make a glass plaque that goes next to the work separate to the artwork. So it's not on the artwork, but it's adjacent to it. But that's unusual too. Usually on public art, they just want you to make the work and you step away and they own it. Right, they own it. Right. If they wanted to make any changes, they need to change, check with you. How does that work? Well, we, we have had, uh, you know, knock on wood, pretty good luck with glass art in the uh, outside in the public environment. And I think that because, as Erwin was saying, that we, we've worked so hard to have public involvement and community involvement in the making of it, they've taken such ownership of that piece that if a kid at the Laurel Library was tagging the artwork with stickers, a nearby resident called us up rather than the library to complain that someone needs to do something and fix the artwork. So we would go out there and clean it up and then say, there you go, it's all looking good. You know, the nice thing about glass is you can scrub it off and you can change it. And the way that uh, Irwin has designed a lot of the components for the installation is that if someone did go crazy and damage one of the tiles, you can strip it out and then replace it. Yeah, yeah. And we have done that, yes. I mean, and we have some glass pieces in in neighborhoods that are maybe not the safest. And we have actually had one that seemed to have been um, penetrated by a bullet. So we replaced that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I feel- survived, Piece in Florida survived a category five hurricane except for two panels. Right, yes, true, true. So, so I can see you guarantee for life. <laughs> Ours, uh, it's not that long. <laughs> that's that's something in the contract with the developer, I guess. <laughs> Wonder there's a hand raise. Trish, you have a question. Yes, I I now live in Rockville in a senior community, and of course I'm on the green team, ah. and we we spend most of our time nagging the management about recycling, and uh, right now we're working on 
trying to get the dining room and all the food preparation and and uh, leftover food composted, working with the county. And we recently went and received an award with, I think, every other place that did the tiniest little bit of recycling from Montgomery County. So we have this round reddish plaque. Did you, I'm wondering if you gentlemen made those. No, is it made of glass? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think we made that one. They should, I'll tell them to contact us for next year because yeah, we make awards and recognitions and things like that for, you know, for organizations, corporations, all that sort of stuff. So this would be a great fit. That's yeah. right. I don't, I don't have it. You know, they've probably got it on the management office wall or something, but, yeah. um, but I'll try. So I didn't even think to, I only glass people I know are you. So there you I go. Think it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the Bethesda Urban Partnership, that's the one we worked with for the Trey Week Prize and for the painting awards. And, um, but I don't know about the recycling people. Well, thank you so very much. And we don't want to keep you, we've already gone over a little bit, but it's fascinating. And the accolades, I'm sure, will continue also. But thank you so much for your time, for participating. And we will have the recording in like a day and a half, usually on our YouTube video. So tell your friends and you can relook at it whenever you want. And uh, of course, we, um, Michael and Erwin, you can have the link and put it on your website or whatever you would like. Okay, uh, excellent. And, well, and we can't wait for Tim Tate. I believe he's in two sessions. Uh, coming so we'll hear a little bit more about your adventures and we are forever your admirers now all right well thank you so much thank you so much thank you for having me it's, it's absolutely wonderful. this was fabulous all thank right. you again very good have a wonderful weekend everybody you too <laughs> thank you bye-bye <laughs>